Give us the brief summary, the, the brief history of Enigma, and explain what we mean when we talk about real-world data, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so we founded Enigma in 2012 really on the premise that we failed to connect the dots during the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. You saw people giving out trillions of dollars of loans without understanding the fundamental variables that actually you know, made for a risky investment or not. You know, home ownership and unemployment were skyrocketing very much so in the same fashion. And people were just looking at the default rates of the last six months of these, these home ownership uh, loans. And what we understood was that there, you know, there was a lot of buzz about data, but there was a big difference in between data that was generated on the internet through user activity. Take the Facebooks, the Googles of the world. Most of what you hear about when you hear about AI and, 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 and big data, which is definitely already an antiquated word, uh, really stems from that kind of activity and that kind of application. The reality, though, is that there's this whole world of, of real world data that we've decided to collect and merge into one unified knowledge graph at Enigma. Things like cargo container shipments, corporate registration records, loans, unemployment, government contracts, you know, the, the footprint of retail activity in a given location. And um, the real world turns out to be much hairier and complex to model. Yeah. W one way you've described in the past is bits versus atoms. Correct. And especially at a conference like this, a lot of people are focused on the former. Yes. And maybe not, not the latter. Yeah, I have this, this notion and this, this way of describing it. It's, you know, when you think about data, you think about instrumentation, right? How is the data collected? And we like to say that there's a world of, of bits, so to speak, log data, click data, uh, all kinds of data that's collected, you know, really through activity by a machine. Whereas this, this world of data that's instrumented in atoms, things that are observed, things that are reported, things that are measured, and, um, you know, the world of atoms is much more chaotic, right? It is not a one-to-one -one comparison. Every different government agency has a different way of classifying things. Every different city has a different way of, you know, doing a health inspection or something along those lines. And it's all about reconciling that, really resolving, moving away from data to entities. Right. And so tell us a bit about Enigma Public, that, that you hoover up all this data from public databases, things like uh, the, what's on container ships and, and uh, restaurant health records and all these kinds of things. And then you put it all online for free, which is yeah, so odd. It, 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 oh, I'll give you a data company, but yes, yes, I'll give you uh, I'll give you a little bit of our basis. The foundation of our company is built on public data. We feel that open data, data that comes from governments, that's uh, uh, generated by you know reporting activities and accountability, um, that becomes the substrate of a certain kind of truth that society needs to transact. You know, we need to know who owns this apartment so that no one can fraudulently sell an apartment, right? And we use that data to build essentially a corpus of people, companies, and places. But we're a very civically minded company. We believe that you know, our mission is to, to basically improve the world around us. And one of the things that we do from a transparency perspective is take all of our raw data, as much as we've collected in the public, and just put it back out there. Anyone can go to public.enigma.com and browse over 100,000 data sets. Um, you know, journalists have used it to break stories. You know, researchers use it. Consultants use it. Uh, it's just our way of connecting you know, back with the community and, and also understanding and sensing what data is used for things, right? We get a lot of ideation from the community in that respect. Do you, you know, coming straight for the, from the co-founder, do you have any, any uh, favorites that you've added to the database recently or anything we should look at? There's, a, there's some really wild stuff in there. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've been working on a project recently with a couple organizations um, to basically stand up tools for um, uh, fighting human trafficking. We work with a lot of banks. 
you know, um, you know, big customers, folks like American Express, you know, uh, 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 folks like BlackRock, BB&T. We, we work a lot in the financial services industry. One of the things that we do is help them fight financial crime. And a very specific topic of that, which is near and dear to us, is sex trafficking. And uh, it is quite difficult for banks to fight people using their services, basically traffic people. And you develop these patterns, or what they call them, uh, 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 basically topologies, queries that you can use, taking client and bank transaction data, merging it with external data. You know, just the other day, we got a list of every single transportation hub in the United States. Like, where are the big bus switching terminals? Where are the big trucking stops? Mm -hmm. And um, screening for transaction, weird transactions at those places, right? Someone, a nail salon, suddenly charges $100,000 near one of those places. There's a type of flag that can, you can use. Um, and I, I've been knee deep in a couple of those data sets these right. days. And, and then um, more broadly, the business of the company, you've been through a few rounds of funding now. It seems like well, more than 100 people. Um, uh, when you do mix public and private data like that, what are what are you know what do your clients come to you for? You can explain a bit. You work a lot with financial services, that right? Pharmaceuticals, that kind of thing. What do they? How does that public data help them make better decisions with all of the enormous databases that they already produce privately about their about their users? I mean, absolutely. So, listen. At the end of the day, um, all of these companies want to provide better client experiences. Yeah. The biggest problem for a lot of these companies is risk management, right? Understanding who they're doing business with, understanding whether an adverse event, you know, a, a pill that was taken and someone had a headache or vomited, like wh wh why and where that is happening, if there's a pattern or trend. And, and basically what we do is we give them context to their internal data. Someone applies for a credit card, you know, uh, it's really hard to give, uh, credit to small and medium businesses. It's all very difficult. In fact, I mean, we've raised $100 million and were rejected for a credit card by many banks just because they don't have the fingerprint that very, very large companies have. Um, you know, I know famously that like uh, uh, a couple billion dollar startups like Spotify were rejected for credit cards because they didn't have a real phone number. They had like a VoIP number. Right, so we're transitioning from old ways of screening people to new ways. And what we do is we take a lot of this public data, external data, data that we gather from uh, other partners as well, and provide uh, uh, basically the fingerprint of a company, person, or place that can be used to make decisions. And that gets injected into their workflow and their decision-making processes, be it credit card underwriting or, you know, uh, pharmaceutical safety triage. Mm -hmm. So, th you know, th there's, there's a lot of startups here and just a lot, of, a lot of bigger tech companies too. I mean, do you, do you think that, I can imagine your answer because of the company you work at, but do you, do you think that they are overlooking real world data, public data they can mix in? If you run a social net network or something that exists mainly in that world of bits, oh, yeah. what, what could they learn from, you know, this, data about bus terminals or container ships, uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, absolutely. There are so many canonical examples of why this data has just tremendously strong signal. There's famous thing, Google flu trends. I don't know if you remember this, where Google, you know, basically was collecting billions of searches across, you know, uh, its platform for I'm sick, I'm, I'm cold, I'm, uh, I'm sneezing, I'm coughing a lot, trying to predict the flu. Well, it turns out that they stopped this program after a couple of years. It was a failure. They you know, missed the mark by you know, a certain magnitude mm -hmm. in predicting flu trends and flu, uh, flu outbreaks, whereas the Center for Disease Control has a more old school method of hospitals reporting into this, much more manual, right? Um, but the signal was much stronger. And the signal was stronger because uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's a real world supply chain of the data versus this kind of large scale approximation. And you know, when, you're, when you're serving an ad on the internet, you can kind of know who the person is. But if you're trying to find you know, uh, uh, someone who's smuggling weapons, mm -hmm. you better be sure that you match their name against your client database. So there's just a granularity to real world data and a signal that's much harder to work with, uh, but uh, we've seen to be potentially a much stronger signal. Yeah. Um you 
And your co-founder of the company met while you were philosophy students, is that That's right? That's correct. So let's get philosophical here because there's a lot of the chat we've had um, at Slush this year around data. You know, we had like Commissioner Vestager yesterday um, talk about trust and how maybe big platforms are abusing the data they have and, and public trust, that kind of yeah. stuff. And also, um, there was a talk uh, yesterday, there was a, a Google exec who was talking about Google Plus, and he sort of hinted that they had dodged a bullet by it not becoming more popular, which meant yeah. they had just avoided all of the, the morass that, that, that like, you know, Facebook and, 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 and some other companies are in now. Um, we had talked before about the ethical supply chain of data. You've seen the inside of lots of public and private databases. Can you just explain to me what you mean by the ethical supply chain of data and what, you know, what works, what doesn't, what's, what are the, the common pitfalls you see of, of, these, of collecting in, information about people, essentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to get philosophical for a second, the whole point is it's not an epistemological problem, i.e., it's not what your data is about, but it's about where it's collected, how it's collected, how it's used. I mean, listen, today we, you know, there's a data set that we provide to all fire departments in the United States, pro bono, um, to help them uh, uh, find slum landlords and inspect for fire, fire detectors in apartments. Um, and that data set could be easily used by an insurance company mm -hmm. to profile minorities in neighborhoods that are you know, uh, 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 right. more yeah, d yeah. disenfranchised and insurance loans. And that, that, that's called redlining. It's like an actual term in the industry. So you need to understand, you know, not only what your data is going to be used for, but how was it collected? Was this data collected by, you know, hacking a, you know, database of, uh, uh, of private information, or was this uh, data collected without the user's knowledge, uh, or was this data collected even badly from a quality perspective? You have to think about, uh, from an ethics perspective, it's really not just what the data says or what the attributes are at face value. It's the whole intention behind it. Uh, that matters, and I, I think you know people are starting to wake up to this much th as they have in other industries. Yeah, and you know, s speaking of, of waking up to that, you know, we're in the land of, of GDPR here, yes. and, and 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 fairly strict regulations about um, the the use and abuse of, of 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 personal data. You know, a big criticism that a lot of tech companies have is that things like GDPR, those kind of opt-in. Um, uh, the, the, Regulations can be kind of a hurdle to collecting data and 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 um, stopping innovation, all these kinds of things. I mean, how would you 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 your company lives on data? That's what yes. that's what its main asset is. I mean, where do you where do you come down on that uh, debate? Well, listen. So it's a, it's just an interesting question for us. I mean, frankly, you know, we deal in a lot of data that by law has been made public mm -hmm. for the purposes of increasing trust in the system. So. We deal in a category of data that's, that's certainly, to begin with, a, a, a has a strong ethical basis and, and rationale. Um, but we mix it with a lot of other external data. We mix it with internal private, uh, private data. So we're very conscious about GDPR. I'd say the point that I think people are missing, and this is traditional of, of folks who have not gone deeply in the com com like into compliance, is that you know, the, it's not just the, it's not just about the burden of complying to this regulation. I think consumer sentiment has fundamentally changed, mm -hmm. right? It is not just about regulation coming in and protecting us for these edge cases. I think people are really frustrated by how large monopolistic technology companies have abused uh, their understanding of people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And that has changed. And GDPR is a regulation, but more importantly, consumer sentiment, you know, will be dri will be the driving force here. And without the users, these companies don't exist. They don't actually provide a value or a service or a good. Yeah. Um, and you know, take an example like the car industry, where you know, 20 years ago, I mean, Ralph Nader in the United States was made famous for this lobbied for car safety and seatbelt regulation and that was a big thing. Today, you know, I think it's, you know, the car, every car advertisement is like, we rank number one. They literally show you the car crashing into a wall in a test dummy. That is the ad for cars, right? Or much like the food industry today, you know, 
uh, regulation on food, organic has become the highest you know, kind of uh, a way to sell uh, a, a product with much higher margin, right? Um, I think we're going to see the same thing in, in, in uh, data and, and privacy. I think our society needs it. I think the internet is a wonderfully connected place, but we've already seen the abuses to it in the US vis-a-vis -vis the democratic system literally being undermined by abuses of, uh, uh, of you know, the, the ways in which we interact on the internet. Yeah. I'll put it that way. This is, this is not the, the usual way, especially at conferences like this, that we talk about tech innovation. But is there, are there things around data governance, around practices, around data that private companies can learn from, from the like, public sphere? You, know, you, you go in and you, and, you, and you pull this data about, uh, that, that comes mainly from governments. Um, and like you said, their, their practices are, are pretty strict. And I mean, it, what, what, what can the private sector learn from the public sector in that? Well, so I think, first of all, I think they both have a lot to learn from each other, yeah. that for sure. But if the private sector can learn anything is that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're delivering services to people, right? And these people are your constituents. You may call them users, you may attach growth rates to them, you may, but they, they will overthrow you, right? Um, and uh, there, there's a certain kind of, at the end of the day, you know, uh, honesty and principled way about thinking about citizens that the government does uh, that have rights, right, that are kind of inalienable. Um, I think a lot of those principles, you know, are, are things from a, from a moral perspective that private, uh, private companies should adhere to, not just because it's the kind of right thing to do, but because it's good business. I mean, take a look at the brands that are being hit by uh, a lot of this stuff on, on the internet, we, like the, 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 the Facebooks of, you know, Facebooks of the world and the Googles of the world. You know, it was only 10 years ago when we were talking about don't do evil, right? And today we're talking about spying on people all over the place. This stuff moves fast. Consumer sentiment moves extremely fast. And, you know, there's no way to stop that other than doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I suppose another thing that Enigma especially is doing is around like, I guess, transparency, you could call it broadly speaking. Correct. You, you put a lot of your data online, freely available, APIs, all this kind of stuff. Most companies for which data is core guard, guard it pretty jealously, both for regulatory and for like competitive reasons. I mean, are, are people a bit too... Uh, Anxious about it? Should should they be more open with it? Would that would that solve some of the problems about trust and? Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of talk about open banking. So, yeah. for instance, you know, um, I bank with uh, with a variety of banks in the United States. Some of them make their APIs available to companies. Some don't, right? And there's been companies who've had massive success, kind of working in this ecosystem, like a company called Played in the United States. The notion is. At the end of the day, uh, the, the, the ecosystem needs to thrive on more standards, more protocols, more connectedness, less silos. You know, just take a look at the history of the internet. We started with walled gardens, we started with AOL and Prodigy, and we eventually opened up to the browser, right? This will happen for real world data too, this will happen for company data too, and it will fundamentally require a negotiation of the data rights with the user for this to, to happen, right? Yeah. I think companies are, are afraid that their data is core. It, it's, not a, it, it's not a really strong idea because at the end of the day, you can always open up just enough to let other people interact. The analysis is what's core. For us, our IP is not just the data that we have, but the insight that we produce from it. That's really what we kind of you know, keep to ourselves as much as possible. It's the learnings, it's the understanding. The infrastructure is getting commoditized. Just look at what AWS is doing. Data will get commoditized. Just look at what everyone else is doing. What will remain is always knowledge, right? Knowledge is the most valuable thing we believe in our industry. Um, and you know, that's definitely the trend that we're betting on. And I think whether people wake up to that or not is, you know, there's plenty of value to be made along the way. Right. Speaking of value, um, so how would, you, how would you describe the business model of Enigma then? We got a bit philosophical there, yes. talking about trust, transparency, public data, and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, to get down to kind of brass tacks, like how, how do you make money from this? So we have a very large corpus of data that 
you know, we give out a lot of the raw materials for free. The refined goods, which we merge into a knowledge graph, is what we sell to folks, get sold on a, a API basis. And, you know, m most of our kind of best use cases, we go even beyond, right? We're not just a content provider. We're actually providing the data linking technology, the ability to match our external data to theirs, other external data to theirs, and provide an insight and make a decision. So in a lot of verticals, be it like KYC or sanctions compliance or anti-money laundering, underwriting, some real world marketing use cases, we're actually making a decision uh, for the client using their data, analyzing that. Uh, and that's a service on top. So it's data and uh, like decision support workflows. Right, I see. Are there, any, uh, are there any other sectors that you have your eye on? What's, what's, what's the most exciting thing that might be untapped for a company like yours? You know, we're starting to um, uh, uh, get into these heavier industry sectors like CPG, okay. uh, logistics, energy. My background is in alternative energy. Um, I think for us, one of the more exciting things is you know, expanding in the US, that's definitely where we are at the moment. But getting into uh, some markets that, um, you know, are perhaps not attended to uh, as strongly as they are, uh, places like Africa, very interesting to Enigma. We have a growing number of, uh, of conversations and partnerships brewing there around things like getting access to credit. Um, there's just a huge problem of folks who are not banked in Africa. I mean, people literally, go out of their way to manage the cash, the little cash that they have. Um, so providing fundamental core identity uh, solutions to folks. That's something that we're very, very interested in. Um, we're always, we always like to go where folks tend not to immediately. As part of what we do, we're a little enigmatic about things, oh, no pun intended. Um, but uh, I think you'll see a lot of us, yeah. a lot of stuff like that coming okay. from us in the Great. future. And so to wrap up in the, in, the, in, the, in the little time that we have left, if there was you know, one thing that, that the audience should take away when they go back and look at the data that they're collecting and how they're collecting it and what they're doing with it and all that kind of stuff. You work with huge amounts of data, which we've been t t talking about. Uh, there's a lot of startups here that are maybe just starting to do that and maybe not thinking through the implications of that. What should yeah. they, what should they take, take away from this? I, I'd say that the biggest thing is, you know, uh, I'll give you a two-fold answer. One is, I think the most interesting use cases are offline, right? They are not about getting an ad or getting someone to convert on something online. Like, that is how we're going to change the world, right? Not, and I use this sentence very sparingly outside of the trips that I make to San Francisco to meet investors, right? Um, no, but I'm very concerned about, uh, about these things. So uh, think about you know, whether what you're doing has an impact in the real world. And the second is um, this notion of, of consumer sentiment around uh, privacy. It is not about slowing down innovation because suddenly now we have to click on an extra button to get to where we need to get to. You know, good, take, good technology makes those experiences disappear. So the technology will get there for us to comply to privacy in a very automated way. We do a lot of that work with some partners. But think about the consumer sentiment that's coming. Think about the fact that people no longer trust you and maybe even need you, right? Uh, to manage their, their social experiences online. Yeah, it's a bracing point to end on. Thank you very much for, for sharing that, and thanks of course. for joining us. Right. Thank you. All right. That was fun. Yeah, that was good.